Through the concrete cracks worn weary by work boots and high heels. Through the concrete cracks showered in tears of sorrow, tears of joy. Through the concrete cracks rumbled by reverberations of a hundred years. A flower on the hill takes its first breath and a grand hope springs. Welcome to the Spring Street Podcast at the intersection of creation and destruction in the heart of downtown Los Angeles. And now, a word from the sponsors. This podcast is sponsored by Starship Kairos, a podcast studio available for bookings in downtown Los Angeles. Starship Kairos is where my guests and I make this show happen. Soundproofed, cozy, and equipped with professional audio gear, Starship Kairos is an ideal location for any type of podcast. Starship Kairos offers a full suite of services, including content consultation, mixing and mastering, and custom jingle writing. For rates and booking, check them out on Instagram at Starship Kairos or click on the link in the description. And now, let's dive in. Emery, my man, welcome to the Spring Street Podcast. Thank you, Sheldon. I am stoked to have you on. I think this might be the first time that I've had a guest on the podcast that I've never actually met in person. Really? Okay, actually, as I'm saying that, there was one other person, but this was the first time that somebody's come to me like as like a reference through somebody else. Like you should interview this guy and Wow, I'm honored. I'm just like coming in totally blind. As are you. Yeah. So, absolutely. <laughs> met you like five minutes ago. <laughs> I'm glad that we're doing this, man. Um, lot to talk about tonight. Uh just to kind of like give a brief summary. You're a singer songwriter, folk artist. You live in a cabin in the woods. I do, in the middle Some of nowhere. Some might say that you're living the uh the indie dream, perhaps. <laughs> um and you're just down here visiting California for a little bit. Also, just got some tattoos. Yeah, we just got some brand new tattoos. Yeah, which is my incredible. first one. That's amazing. Yeah. So I definitely want to talk to you about that. Um, but I want to go back to the beginning first of where it all started for you with music. Sure. Did you grow up in a musical home? Are you an outlier in your family when it comes to playing music? How did it all begin, man? Um, I guess they always say that it sort of skips a generation. So my parents weren't growing up, but they did have like impeccable taste. And uh, we always had on anything classic. So I feel very fortunate to grow up with good music around. Mm -hmm. And um, But my grandmother played piano and uh, my uncle was a drummer and uh, my great uncle was also a drummer. And so it was, it was around, but very tangentially. Yeah, it's nothing in the gene pool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, somewhere. What was some of the stuff you guys were listening to growing up? Um, the Beatles, Led Zeppelin. The first record I ever bought was uh, Houses of the Holy with my own money. So okay. that's, I feel like that was a uh, that was kind of a turning point. Yeah. I think I listened to that when we were driving through Death Valley or something. And wow. I was like, this is what I want to do. I think I want to make music. And I was probably like 11. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Prior to that, did you have any other like wild childhood dreams of like I want to be a astronaut or I want to oh, be yeah. a, an architect or <laughs> yeah I, w I wanted to be an Olympian. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, I wanted to uh, go to the Olympics for gymnastics. I did gymnastics oh, for okay. like ten years. Wow! And um, you know, I was pretty damn good. I, what were the events that you did? Is it called events in yeah. gymnastics? Okay, and there there's like all of them. I did all of them, but mm -hmm. I like won the floor exercise in the state of Texas. Damn. And so I was like, okay, clearly I have some sort of chops for this. Is that when you're going from like corner to corner doing flips? Exactly that. Dude. Yep. That's insane. And if you want to pan the camera, I, I'll do a backflip right yeah. here. <laughs> that's how we're going to end this. All right. Backflip off of the table. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. Do you ever incorporate that into your concerts? Wow. I haven't even thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> I did do uh, like some musicals growing up. Okay. And so I was doing musicals and they realized like the directors that I could tumble and stuff. So that yeah. was incorporated in that. Yeah. But it wasn't in any way for music. It was just like some little candy off yeah. that I can also tumble. <laughs> Have you ever heard of this rapper named Jaleel? Yes. You know, okay. I've heard so the name. Jaleel, whenever he comes out, I've only seen him twice. But in those both those times that I've seen him, 
how he enters the stage is he runs on a stage and does a backflip. Wow. That's like his opening move. What an entrance. I think usually combined with like a ripping off the shirt too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or like, like the snap pants down the side. It's insane. <laughs> but without fail, you'll see this dude do a backflip. So next time I come out to one of your shows, or I guess the first time. Yeah. I'm really hoping to see some acrobatics, man. Oh, I'm, man. Some gymnastics. I'm going to have to throw it in there. <laughs> <laughs> so at what point did you begin to realize, I mean, if you won in the state of Texas, I'm assuming you were in high school at that time? Yeah. Okay. So did you do gymnastics all through high school? No, I actually quit very early into high school when mm. I realized that that wasn't like, that was going to be my whole life if I mm. continued on that path. And... um I was like, I don't think, you know, I want to have friends. I want to go to birthday parties. I want to go yeah. to school. I don't want to be homeschooled. And so. Were you homeschooled at the time? No. But okay. like to keep going further, you're in the gym like six hours every day. And that's just wow. your whole life. And yeah. I realized it wasn't for me. Yeah. Did you have friends in that world who stayed in? Yeah, definitely. And, and where did they end up going? Just people have like won world championships and such, but wow. uh, none of my friends have been in the Olympics or anything. I don't have that kind of street cred. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's such an interesting path. Like the kids who grow up in these really intense sports environments. Yeah. And I feel like it happens a lot of different ways. Like sometimes you have a parent who's just like, my kid is going to do this. Yep. And sometimes you have a kid who just like really excels and people are like just guiding. Like you got to, you know. Yeah. Where did you kind of fall into in that spectrum? I don't think my parents really knew that that was something that I was excelling at until until I did. But mm -hmm. they they were never pressured me, so it was always yeah. a choice. Um, definitely very fortunate to be given that choice. And when I left, they were like, "Cool, yeah. What do you want to do?" <laughs> wow. Yeah. So at that time, was music already like? beginning to be a really big part of your life or was there a gap where you were kind of just like figuring out what to to fill in the blank yeah there was that gap so after gymnastics i went into acting and oh, um okay that's why i moved out to la actually hmm. and um acted in some independent films short films and like a commercial here and there this was in high school no this was after high school oh, okay yeah this okay. was uh, right after i graduated college i moved out to los angeles and got it I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to act. And mm -hmm. that's something that I love as well, but kind of slipped out of it and yeah. realized it didn't do the same thing for me. Fascinating. Um, the music did. So where did you go to college? University of Texas. Okay. Yeah. So you were like Texas born and bred. Like, oh, yeah. All the way through. Yeah. I unfortunately didn't get the accent. Um, yeah, that's interesting. But I I mean, I could. I'm, I, I I'm could sure have. you could fake your way through <laughs> it, man. And... Is it Houston, Texas? Or? Yeah. Okay, Houston, from Texas. Houston. Mm -hmm. Wow. Deep South. <laughs> Man, is it? Does it feel weird to be in California, or does that transition not really phase you much? It didn't really phase me much. I think. Um, yeah. Is I, there a part of you though that wants to go back to Texas? Yeah. No, I don't think I would live in Texas yeah. again. I'm like damn proud to be from there, mm -hmm. but. Uh, I'm glad I live where I do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that cuz sure. I you know, reading your little bio on Spotify, I saw like lives in a cabin in the woods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what what is that all about, man? I did you build this cabin? Oh man, I where wish did this I idea built that cabin. come from? How long have you been living in the cabin? What's the story there? I uh my uncle um is subleasing it to us. So it's just like a little hookup that we got. Nice. And um he doesn't live there anymore, and while he did, he always, like, let me bring my gear up from L.A. into Northern California and just record there. So wow. that's where I recorded the first couple songs um, that are out under my name. Wow. And, um, yeah, I just transitioned or brought the gear up. And uh, So I'm assuming you have electricity in the cabin. There is electricity. Okay. There's no heat. There's oh, no uh, AC, okay. so we do have a little wood stove that we make fires in every morning. It's part of the ritual. Wow. Coffee and fire. Wow. Yep. So are you out, like, chopping wood at, oh, yeah. every week? And, mm -hmm. It's wow. wildly meditative. I believe it, man. Yeah. What are some of those other idiosyncrasies that come along with, like, that experience of living in a cabin in the woods? Um, just the fact that there are no stores really close, mm -hmm. so... 
uh, we were down in Orange County and we were having dinner with friends and we were missing some ingredients and my friend was like, oh, want me to run to the store and grab some A1 sauce? And I was like, no, 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 no. I don't want to put you out. And he was like, no, it's like two minutes away. Yeah. And that's foreign to me now. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a whole excursion leaving the cabin. And wow. if you leave once, you definitely don't want to leave twice in a day. Hmm. Yeah. How long does it take to get to like the closest city? Not, not really. It's not that far. It's like 25 minutes. Okay. But still, that's not like just hopping down the street and... Going to Ralph's or... Yeah. And I mean, we don't have any neighbors or anything, so it's wow. just like pitch blackness and dead silence at night and... Whoa. Yeah. It, it's gorgeous. Dang. You know, I lived um, downtown LA for about four years and it's, it's hard for me to sleep sometimes when it's just silent because I'm so used to just sirens and yeah. yelling and, you know, the noise of the city. Yeah. Was there a bit of an adjustment period for you getting used to the silence or? There was a little bit of, um, there was a little adjustment, but mm. it came pretty quickly. I mean, the first couple of times you sleep out there alone, it's, you know, a little freaky because you're out yeah. there in, in, in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I don't know, it can be like unsettling, but I slipped into it really easily, I think. Yeah. Do you guys have bears out there? Do we have bears out there? No, I'm being told no. We don't have bears. <laughs> we do have mountain lions. We have uh, oh man, cats, large cats. What about wolves? No wolves. No wolves. No wolves yet. Some, some coyotes. Yeah, definitely coyotes. Okay. Yeah, coyotes uh, aren't like too freaky. No, no. I mean, maybe if I saw a pack of them. I wouldn't fight one, but yeah. Yeah. We got a lot of turkeys. A lot of wild really? turkeys. Yeah. Oh shit. Just like hordes. hordes Are you of allowed turkeys. to kill them? You're not. Damn. But like nobody would really know, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can, yeah, it is what it is. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, being up in the woods, it's so funny. Like, I'm realizing having this conversation, just how much of a city person that I am, like asking these questions as if this is like the craziest thing in the world. And yet, for people who like people do it all live the in the woods they're like yeah this is totally normal <laughs> yeah like, i'm like do you have this and do you have that <laughs> right 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 your television <laughs> come up and stay for a week man dude i would love to man yeah. that honestly a dream of mine is to just build a cabin in the woods or have a hundred acres with some friends and build some tiny homes and yeah. have some small scale agriculture like that is a definite dream of mine yeah we definitely want to invest in some chickens or some ducks yeah chickens would be great point. yeah so what made you want to make this transition though because not everybody in the I, i'm assuming you're in your 20s yeah 29 29 hey same yeah 94 94 baby right, was your birthday june okay yeah, I'm, we're we're very close. May. May's yours. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Um, I don't think that you know a whole lot of people our age, at least people who come from urban environments like Los Angeles, have that experience of right. like living out of you know a big city. Yeah. Let alone not having neighbors and living in nature. Right. What made you want to do that? Well, I used to see it sort of as like the end game. That's what mm. I wanted. And I was sort of devoting my life to acting and like foregoing present happiness to be working for some delayed gratification that I was always told would come if you kept doing it. Yeah. Um, but I didn't realize how really unhappy I was at the time. So when that cabin was kind of thrown in our laps and I was like, oh, well, this is kind of what I've wanted. I just thought there was going to be a lot more first that I needed to do to be able to mm -hmm. get to a place where that was sustainable. Yeah. Um, and I was like, if I don't move out of the city and into this cabin, I'm going to kick myself forever. Mm -hmm. uh, so after we moved, I realized how unhappy I was in the city and that mm. I can be working towards a long-term goal and still be happy and enjoy my life in wow. the meantime. And yeah, that was something that I really didn't even realize I was missing because I was so caught up in the hustle mentality. Yeah. I think that's really easy in Los Angeles to be caught in. It's a rat race. Yeah, you tell me. <laughs> Dude, it, it 100% is. I mean, I feel like I'm in the middle of that rat race, man. Yeah. Like, it is a nonstop grind. Yeah. Like, I feel like just to stay afloat in this city, 
It's expensive. It's fast paced. I mean, a New Yorker might scoff at that, yeah. but it can be fast paced. I, I believe it. Yeah. Depending on like what you're doing. Um, but slowing down after we moved up there was like when I intentionally give myself space to be bored. Yeah. And then boredom can be the birthplace of creativity. But, mm. you know, it's a little more difficult when you always feel like you're catching up in, in the city, or at least yeah. that's how I felt in Los Angeles. Mm. Always chasing. Yeah. Yeah. So is music your full time gig right now, or, or do you also have another job up north? Yeah, side job. I, I mean, I worked at a coffee shop. I've worked at coffee shops and customer service my whole life. Nice. Um, yeah, transitioning into uh, a new side gig right now that should hopefully be more sustainable and it's remote, so yeah, I can work from the woods. Yeah, because you got Wi-Fi. Yeah, we got Not Wi-Fi. Not just electricity, you got Wi-Fi. Isn't that wild? We Most have Wi-Fi important. out there. Yeah. I mean, at the very least, you could always have Starlink, so. Oh, man, we've thought about it. Then again, I think it doesn't, doesn't like, if it's too forced or too wooded of an area, like the Starlink gets fucked up. Yeah, I think you ha- have to have an open sky. Yeah. That's what I've heard. You just have to climb yeah. one of those trees. <laughs> exactly. There's a giant section of tree that's missing. Like, all the branches have been cut off because uh, my uncle, when he lived there, uh, the Wi-Fi signal went right through the tree, and hmm. so it just didn't work. So he's like, I can fix that, and he just cut down all the branches on one side of the tree. <laughs> it's funnier if you see it. I'll show you a picture after. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. So do you envision yourself being in this cabin for a long time, or do you have plans to get your own plot of land and build your own cabin? Yeah, that well, that is the dream, um, to be able to own the land and then build our own space. Own that land? Not not the land that okay. we're on now. Yeah. Got it. Um, but that is what we want to do eventually. But the setup is so perfect right now, and I cannot take it for granted, and I yeah. owe so much to it. Um, both mental health wise and what's what it's afforded me to be able to find musically within myself. So mm-hmm. I don't take it for granted and I'm not in a hurry to leave, but we do want to own something and build our own spot. Yeah. Now I got to ask, cause I'm, I'm curious about this. I can imagine that being in a more of a remote place, you're obviously saving money for a lot of reasons, probably like lower rent you don't have friends wanting you to go out and do you don't have friends. things that are <laughs> Yeah, sure. <laughs> you don't have like expensive outings that are costing you a hundred dollars. Yeah, each we never night, we know? never eat out. <laughs> yeah. Ever. I mean, we get groceries for the week and then just cook. Yeah. So that's something that we do quite a bit. Um, but I was gonna also... say on the other side of that, I can imagine that there are certain things that are maybe um, more inconvenient. Or things that you really have to like plan for or think about. So, when it all kind of comes out, like, do you feel like is a more frugal way of living that you're living now compared to how you were living in LA? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and and pretty much any way possible. Hmm. Yeah, just for all those reasons you just said. That's interesting. Yeah. Does it freak you out though? Like when I think about my life in Los Angeles, there's so many insane opportunities that are always presenting themselves. You know, it seems like even when I've been in a pinch, like something always comes up, some kind of crazy job opportunity. Um, There's just so much here in the city. Right. And for myself, removing myself from the city seems daunting because I I can, all I think is like, what what am I going to, what am I going to do for work? Like, how am I going to make this work? Right. Did that fear ever, you know, pass through your mind or... Yeah. Thought process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, It's a double edged sword, right? Because there is so much in a city, so many like opportunities to meet people just daily and Mm -hmm. and going out. And uh, yeah, removing yourself from that is sort of a shift to focusing inward in more of a way. And I think it was, I was watching an interview with, um, might have been like Ben Howard or someone like that. And he was giving advice to musicians. Um, and he said something along the lines of don't worry about scenes. And that really resonated with me. He was like, you can, Mm. you can do it from anywhere in terms of the music. The business is a different story. So yeah, I'll let you know when I figure that out. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That's the ultimate, uh, mystery right there Yep, for sure. Yeah. Well, this is a perfect transition to talk about your music. Sure. So 
At what point did you realize, hey, I want to pursue this seriously? I think it was my last year in college. Yeah, right before I graduated. Um, I was playing a lot more and writing more songs and it kind of took a back burner to acting. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't progressing or growing as much as a musician or as a songwriter. Um, I was kind of doing some things here and there with acting, but I kind of realized that for me, at least the whole, like you can do everything, you can do both. It wasn't really working like Mm -hmm. being a uh, sort of a jack of all trades. it, It wasn't really working for me. I wasn't really excelling at either of those two facets. So after I just kind of decided wholeheartedly to focus on music, I feel like I was able to find more of an authentic sound in mm. myself and um, started growing, I think. Hmm. Yeah. What were some of the markers of that growth? Just putting out songs that I was proud of. Hmm. Uh, I played in a band in Los Angeles while I was here and um, I mean, the songs are bangers, but <laughs> they're not really, um, I don't know. I feel like it was kind of turned into something. Uh, maybe it was produced in a way that felt like the songs were being taken away from the original vision or where mm-hmm. they were written from rather. So when I just started recording myself in the cabin, it, I was just losing myself to hours experimenting and seeing what felt good. And that is not a luxury that anyone has in like a studio when you're paying for space in a mm-hmm. in a recording studio in LA. So Yeah. Yeah. So have you mostly been self produced? Um I produced a couple songs of my own and that's when um a producer caught his attention or I caught his attention with my work. Mm-hmm. And uh, Is that Tyler? That's Tyler. Cool. Yeah. Shout out to Tyler. Tyler Neil Johnson, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Um Yeah. And he was he was like, I love what you're doing. I don't want to change what you're doing. I would like to help you uh, find a way to make this sound accessible to everybody. Mm. And that's just by like polishing it up production wise. Mm. And um, he had the experience and the know-how to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So did you ever go out to Montreal? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, Uh, sweet. Yeah, that's where I recorded. We went out in February, um, just recorded over a week in like the dead, frozen, dead Canadian winter. Yeah, man. It yeah. was gorgeous. That's that's incredible. Montreal's a really cool city. It's so fun. I've only been there um, once before. I toured through there gotcha. years ago yeah. in the summer, so much warmer. <laughs> Man, they're baguettes, the food of all kinds. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, I'm excited to go there again. Yeah. So, you Any plans to? Are you going to? Yeah, I headed on February. Nice. Yeah, visiting a friend, so. Right on. Um, but yeah, I haven't been, I haven't been to Montreal in years. Go back, man. It misses you. Yeah, it definitely does. So, yeah. um, was that your first time in Canada? Mm-hmm. First time, Dude, like amazing. really out of the country. I would yeah. Say. I hope my country was uh, good to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are you Canadian? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. I'm from Vancouver, BC. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful place. Have you ever played uh, any shows up in Canada at all? Or have not. Oh, it was just for the week that I went up to record. Yeah. Yeah. Touring. Have you ever done like much touring at all? Not at all. Just shows that um, I've been able to pick up around San Francisco mm-hmm. here and there. And I played a bunch in Los Angeles, but uh, no touring yet. Dude, we're gonna have to book you here at some point in time, man. Yeah. I'd we love to get on a bill. Yeah. That. Would, I mean, that would be a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, what's that scene like? up in the Bay Area when it comes to indie folk music? It's actually pretty good. I feel like there's a sort of a a little community pocket there um, for not just DIY music, but people that are making real music. And Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't really able to find that community in Los Angeles. I'm sure it's here somewhere or um, if anyone's looking, but I wasn't able to find it. And uh, up in SF, I do feel like it's there. There are a bunch of cool venues, like smaller hole-in-the-wall venues, but... Yeah, what are, are, what are some of them called? Bottom of the Hill. Okay, is a really cool one. Uh, Cafe du Nord. Heard of either of those? I think I've heard of Cafe du Nord actually. Yeah, there's some good spots. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Have you ever been down to Morgan Hill by any chance? Uh uh-uh. uh Morgan Hill is this tiny little like suburb outside, like in the Bay Area. I think I want to say like southwest of San Francisco. Yeah, I got some friends up there. 
cute little town, but it has this main street, this like strip that is super vibrant and alive on a Friday night, maybe even like Thursday and Saturday as well. And I think they do like, you know, some stuff with singer songwriters at some of these like of um, like restaurants and pubs. Beautiful. But incredible little town yeah. if you're ever passing through morgan hill i highly recommend stopping okay like f for a friday night or saturday night it's not that far i think it's like 45 minutes from us oh really yeah yeah no it's it's a super cool little spot so beautiful so with where you're at right now what are what is your main focus is your main focus performing is it writing is it trying to get more support whether that it looks like you know, private investment or a label? Yeah, essentially trying to get some backing to be able to um, get on the road. Yeah. So, yeah, touring is where I think I should be putting most of my energy now and just sort of taking the right steps in order to get there. So, mm -hmm. like with, with releasing uh, the record that I'm putting out right now, three of the songs are out, and then the whole five-song EP, um, which is what it is, will be out, like, next month. And so... Hopefully that'll put me in more of a position to be able to get on the road and nice. open for people. And you're releasing this on your own, like completely independent, right? Mm-hmm. Wow. I would like to get some label backing. Yeah. Yeah. If there's any out there, <laughs> this guy. <laughs> Warner, I hope you're I hope you're listening. Atlantic Sony. Atlantic Records. Yep. <laughs> Kean right here. Um you know, it's so not Interscope though. Uh, I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Interscope. He's not interested. Um, it's fascinating this day and age when it comes to releasing music as an independent artist because there's so many ways to go about it. Um, and I feel like playlisting has been such a big part of a lot of artists' journeys. Even just today, I was looking at your Instagram and I saw that you got put on like the fre like Fresh Finds Folk. Fresh, yeah, Fresh Folk uh, Spotify's playlist. Um, yeah, that was a, that's amazing. Big man. day, big day today. Congratulations. Man. Yeah, I appreciate that. Have you been submitting your songs to different playlists or using like Submit Hub at all? What's your process? Been yeah, like? definitely using Submit Hub. Also working uh, with a distribution um, boutique distribution agency uh, based in the UK. Interesting. And um, they're pushing. They're pushing. Hmm. And uh, it's definitely helping. And How uh, does that process look? What, the distribution agency? Yeah, the distribution agency. They just kind of do the same thing that I've been doing um, w with, like, my own PR, mm -hmm. but on a larger scale with uh, their own network of contacts, um, people that I wouldn't be able to just reach myself. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And do you pay for that service, or do they have an agreement with you? How do, What does that look like? Yeah, it's an agreement. So they would they take a percentage mm -hmm. of, um, say a song does really well and gets a ton of streams, and, you know, I make $10, then... They'd, they'd be able to take two. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. Man, how did you get connected with that um, that setup, um, the distribution or publishing? Yeah, I, I was listening to uh, this guy, Jack Van Cleef. I'm not sure if you've heard of him. He's also a up-and-coming folk guy. Mm -hmm. Incredible talent. And uh, I just talked to him after one of his shows and went out and saw him. And he was like, reach out to them because they really helped me out. So mm. What are they called? What a great plug. Canvas. Canvas. Canvas distribution. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Check them out. All right. Yeah. Put that in the link mm -hmm. in the description. So, um, what are some of when you're kind of looking forward into the future on your musical career journey? Are there any particular milestones that you want to hit, or are you kind of just like taking it all as it comes? There are definitely milestones. I would like to have an album out before I'm 30. Mm -hmm. I would definitely like to do that. I, I would mean, also... It's, it's, it's coming up. That's it's coming, coming up. up so, I mean, I got to start writing something. Yeah. But, um, that... Um, but I'm not like pushing any narrative or trying to fit a puzzle piece. Um, I think after I left LA and started kind of letting some unknown force... Uh, yeah, giving into that, then things started moving a little bit easily, mm -hmm. a little more easily for me. Um, yeah, I guess just that. So there are milestones, but mostly just seeing what happens and continue 
focusing on just like writing good songs and yeah. songs that I'm proud of, songs that are true to me. And um, I think everything else should fall into place or a place, whatever that place looks like, if um, I just do what I do, you know. Mm-hmm. This might be a hard question to answer, but what differentiates to you a song that you're proud of versus a song that you don't feel satisfied with? Well, that's a great question. Um, something that I can still get to the place that it was written from while I'm performing it and give an authentic performance um, that I am emotionally connected with in a way that hopefully the audience can connect with as well. And yeah, something that just feels energetically authentic and um, that I don't mind playing over and over again, even if it sounds <laughs> different every time. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So something that has staying power with me emotionally. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I find that's a really interesting experience as a songwriter. The songs that I'm, that I always find myself returning to versus stuff that I am more okay to let slip away. Right. I think on a personal level, time is the, the ultimate factor there. Yeah. That makes total sense. Like, you know, 10 years later, what songs am I still playing? Yeah. Versus what songs do I not really care to, right. you know, sit down and play anymore? Yeah. Which is an interesting thing because it's just, you have to, in a, in a way, you just got to be patient sometimes. Yeah, so, absolutely. There's also that, like, novel excitement. I don't know if you can relate to this, but, like, when you write a song and you're just, so stoked about it and you just keep playing it yeah you know that's like peak peak dopamine experience and then can you maintain that like is it still that exciting or can you get to somewhat of an exciting place you know yeah two years after you write it are you intentional with your songwriting process in a scheduled or like routine kind of way or do you write just when the lightning strikes i think there's definitely discipline to it I'm writing every day um, or playing every day or doing something every day, but mm-hmm. it's it's a compulsion. It's not something that I'm like, okay, it's 2 p.m. It's time for me to sit down and play guitar for an hour. It's never any process like that. It's more just like it's built in by now. Mm. So it is discipline because you need to put yourself in a position where you can be inspired. And if you're not sitting down and doing that, then yeah. it you won't just be inspired. Yeah. Yeah, I I definitely believe that the the whole like waiting for inspiration to strike. Yeah, I feel like that's bullshit. Hmm. It's and, interesting. Unless unless you disagree in which case I don't feel like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you should feel exactly how you feel, man. I think that I do disagree. Okay. Be- actually no, I I do disagree. Okay. Um I'm so because- sorry. <laughs> And that is where this podcast comes to a head. <laughs> no, um, for me with my songwriting, I um, it's it's super sporadic. There have been times in my life where I've been intentional and decided I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write a song and whatever it is, it is. But that's the exception. By and large, um, I feel like it's always random, spur of the moment, spontaneous, and incredibly like gripping. So I'll be in a situation where I'm just, you know, playing around, and then suddenly something just starts to feel like the beginning of something. And then it's like this force just comes over me, and I can't walk away from the guitar until like the song has been like birthed. Right out of me and if it, it just it feels totally sporadic do you feel like there is a any difference between the quality of songs that are pretty instantaneous versus the quality of songs that take like 10 years to write that's a great question <laughs> um to be honest i don't even know that i have a good enough sample size of like the latter Right, because I feel like the so much of what I've written was just spur of the moment. Yeah. That being said, though, I think 
when I when I reflect on well, it's it's so weird. You know, the album that I put out that I did with Andy Park, uh, it's called Belarus. With that, he really challenged me with my songwriting. Like he wouldn't just accept a song that I brought to him. He would push back and say, Well, like, can you say that a different way? Or like, can you can you, you know, like convey this feeling without making it sound so cheesy or you yeah. know? And him pushing back on me forced me to dig more into those songs. So when I think of when I listen to that record, I love what I hear. I'm like, wow, yes, I do really love this. But then I mean, it's interesting too because Sometimes other songs that maybe are a little bit more raw or simplistic or were written and never edited just hit on a certain level that I'm like, I don't want to change a thing about this. Yeah. So. It, it's like a Springsteen's Nebraska, if you're familiar with that one. He um, just recorded all the demos for that album on like a four track in a hotel room in one night. And then they wow. tried to re-record them all in the studio for like the next six months. And they were like, there's clearly something intangible on these like lonely demos. Mm -hmm. So Springsteen just was like, well, let's master it and put it out. Yeah. I, so I want to get your thoughts on this yeah. because this is something that I've been thinking about a lot lately um, with trends, you know, whether it's music, fashion, movies, a lot of times things move in cycles for example with fashion like you know 80s attire like came back in the yeah. kind of like mid 2000s and nowadays it feels like the early 2000s are in with like the gen Z, yeah, 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 gen yeah. alpha population which on a side note like you guys should just skip that period of time because it was not good <laughs> like just skip the early 2000s um, everyone looks like they're in the matrix and it's right. just weird. <laughs> super, super low cut jeans. <laughs> oh my God. And the stupid sunglasses. I'm just sounding like an old man. Right oh, now. like these? No. <laughs> uh, dude, if you pull those out, that would, we'd have some real problems. No. Like, <laughs> it was good. It was um, good talking to you, man. <laughs> backflip your way out. Right. <laughs> um, no. So with music though. In the early 2000s and kind of like leading up into like the 2010s, I feel like music was getting really polished, like really, really, really dialed in. And then you also had like the advent of auto tune and um, the devil himself. Yeah, just like tools that made it possible to make like um, almost like airbrushing a photo, like you're you're taking something and you're making it more real than it even is. Yeah. And lately I've noticed that it seems like there's this trend among Gen Zs and younger people towards something that's a little bit more real and more raw and more authentic. Whether that's like posting a shitty photo of yourself on your like Tinder profile, yeah. you know, or your Instagram or putting out an album like Zach Bryan that is like raw and imperfect and like like i was listening to it and i'm like some of these drums sound like they're out of time yeah and like that guitar kind of sounded a little out of tune there and like his voice like went a little flat do you think anybody notices that that's okay that's like a, that's a good question yeah, it's just musicians that, that notice that's that. see that's that's a great question but i do feel like and i, I want to know your opinion like do you do you think that there's any kind of a movement right now within music towards something less polished, less refined, more raw. Yeah, definitely. And um, it's far more relatable that way. And so authentic by proxy. And uh, I think that maybe started a lot with like For Emma by Bon Iver mm. and like his just like completely unorthodox, just like the guitars are all out of time. Yeah. There's like a bajillion vocal layers. And he also <laughs> just thought they were demos. And uh, mm. it just has this like realism yeah. to it that is something that often gets lost in the search for perfection. Yeah. I think it takes away some of the soul, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, not to say that there aren't perfect songs that also have soul, but I definitely think there is a movement towards that. And um, I wish it was bigger. Hmm. Yeah. Is that something that you're trying to pull in to your own music? 
Yeah, absolutely. What does that look like for you? Um, lately, I've just been into trying to get full performances the whole way through, whether that's just mm-hmm. like playing guitar and singing like one performance. Mm-hmm. And then I think that if you're doing both at the same time, like playing guitar and singing, you're focused on playing guitar. So you're not really worried about trying to make the vocal sound perfect. Mm-hmm. So you can like intentionally distract yourself that way. And then it is coming from like a more real place or whether that's like recording not to a metronome, if there's not going to be drums on it. Um, Man, God bless that trend if it becomes a trend. I'm so down. <laughs> That'd be great. Sign me up. No more metronome. Yep. But also just like no auto tune. Yeah. Like I'm not going to use auto tune. Um, yeah, just trying to be real in the in the emotion of the performance of it and, and finding an honest place that you're singing from and playing from. And, um, you know, hopefully everything lines up to the grid if you're not recording to tape. Um, Mm -hmm. and yeah you want it to be perfect but i think some of the most beautiful parts are in the imperfections and Mm. that's how it should be yeah it gives it a human aspect yeah well i think that that's increasingly important in like the advent of ai oh yeah and distinguishing like what is made by a human versus what is an amalgamation of things kind of like a collage of the internet but mistakes and accidents are something that's uh, only human um, right and sometimes that's where the magic comes in or that's where like a whole song a whole new song can come out of an accident Mm -hmm. and um or singing in a way that like you've really felt like i have emotions and i'm putting it into this and Mm -hmm. a computer's not going to be able to mimic that yeah with ai where do you draw inspiration I think from recently it's been time spent away from music. So I I read uh, Rick Rubin's book, The Creative Act. Nice. You know it? Yeah. Yes. I got to read it. I've I've only watched interviews of him like talking about it, but I really want to read it. Oh, yeah. It's bigger than the Bible. Mm. Um, it's I took something from that. He said, uh, make your life the center of your art rather than making art the center of your life. And that resonated with me quite a bit and just reinforced that time spent away from music is time well spent. And so he he talked about how, like, just go take a trip, get out in nature, do something for yourself, see something new, and uh, that's going to feed your soul. Mm -hmm. And anything that feeds your soul ultimately will come out in your creative output. And uh, it's okay to have a life and then make the story the music rather than just constantly only being focused on like that chase Mm. that I experienced in Los Angeles. Mm. Does that make any sense? Am I making sense here? Yeah, no, definitely. Well, I think it's so easy to get like, to get caught up in that chase Yeah, and to lose sight of of the story of your own life. Right. And the things that bring you joy, whether, you know, whether that's, well, I think, I mean, a lot of people in this city are dissatisfied and unhappy and bitter. And I think that part of it is maybe because we place such an emphasis on some kind of ultimate success. Like I'm going to make, I'm going to land this huge movie and it's going to change my life or I'm going to get this big record deal and it's going to change my life or blow up on TikTok or whatever it is. Right. And in pursuit of that, you can, you know, you can lose so much if you neglect the things that are really important. Yeah. Your friends, your family, your health, especially. Um, yeah. Sometimes you got to stop and snort the roses. Snort those roses, man. Yep. Snort those roses and smell that coffee. Yeah. Thorns you, and all. You care? We take a quick pause. Yeah. Okay. We're back. Sweet. I hope we didn't lose too much of the video, but, you know, whatever. No, we just got a couple beers down the street. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, do we should have, man. That sounds <laughs> great. Are there any good, um, I don't know, local breweries up up near the cabin where you live? Our front porch. Yeah, are you guys brewing beer out there? No, not at all. I'm just drinking wine out you there. You guys are distilling some whiskey. Oh, That's what you're great. actually doing up there in the woods. Yep, the music <laughs> thing's a cover. 
It's a front. <laughs> oh man, we're making shine. It's funny to me that that's still um, like an, an actually like pretty controlled activity. Like you can actually get into some big trouble for distilling your own whiskey. I'm pretty sure. Can you really? Yeah. No way. Yeah, Why? it's definitely not as chill as like brewing. Like anybody can brew their own. But beer. you can grow your own weed. Yeah, but you cannot distill your own whiskey. <laughs> Someone correct me if I'm wrong. I there's a book somewhere on the shelf all about distilling whiskey, and uh, it talks about it. Yeah, it's, that's the one with all the highlighter marks in it. Yeah, <laughs> all the notes, all the phone numbers, yep. all the uh, yeah. You know, maybe one day, you know, yeah. but that'll be on my cabin. Right. In the right, right. And so, <laughs> man, well, who are some of the artists that really inspire you, man? Who are the people that you, uh, you continually return to? I think off top, it's, it's going to have to be, um, like Olivia Rodrigo. <laughs> <laughs> um, I knew it. <laughs> I could Can you hear the it. resemblance? <laughs> um, She's talented, man. She, she is, not to knock. <laughs> um, yeah, I think just like the, the, all the big heavy hitter classics, like Tom Petty is a mm. big one. Um, Neil Young, Jeff Buckley, Nick Jeff Drake. Jeff Buckley is yeah. incredible. Nick Drake, too. I discovered Nick Drake so late yeah. in life. Like, Last so year, did maybe. everybody else after he died. It's crazy. Yeah. Was he famous, though, in his lifetime? No, not at all. Damn. Yeah, he killed himself at, um, like, 24 years old. What? Yeah. Sad story. Dude. But since then, people love him. Yeah, it's so insane hearing those stories. Like, do you know the story about um, the Searching for Sugar Man documentary? Yeah. Dude is famous in South Africa and has no idea. Right. And is just living a pretty gnarly, hardcore life in Detroit. Yep. And he's like a sensation elsewhere. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. I guess it happens. I mean, nowadays I feel like it'd be easier to be a sensation elsewhere. Yeah. Why? One of my, one of my buddy. Well, because just the proliferation of the content that we create across the whole world. Yeah. One of my buddies is, uh, he's a really talented musician. He's a vibraphone player. Very niche, but like incredible. He also plays jazz piano, just a really smart like musician. Yeah. And he recently hit a million subs on YouTube. He's got like over a billion uh, streams. But I think the majority of his streams come from India and Indonesia. Interesting. So he might be a sensation. Yeah, he should go on a tour over Out there. there. He honestly should. I feel like he would kill it. Yeah. Bring his vibraphones. Yep. Do a vibraphone tour. Vibraphone solos. The bring whole the, set. Bring the vibes. Yep. Yep. But, yeah, I mean, you must look at your uh, Spotify for artists mm -hmm. and see all the different countries and cities where people are listening to your stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's really cool uh, to see that it's connecting with people. I mean, you know, and countries that i don't know how to pronounce so yeah what are your top countries uh I, I don't even know i mean i can imagine it's probably america right like america canada yeah like i think yeah that i think there's some in australia yeah uh, i don't know there should be more in australia for sure because i would like to tour there so oh my goodness dude touring in australia would be it would that be the dream tour australia probably yeah that, that in europe yeah yeah you know, I've heard a lot of good things about touring in Europe for like indie folk artists. Really, and and not just any folk artists. I just brought a guy on the sh on the podcast last week, who he's in like a post rock kind of like ambient hardcore cool. kind of band. Yeah, and when they tour Europe, they have an amazing, um, like amazing reception. Like the people will come out, they'll support, um, you know, buy their merch, I guess. And that's just typically what I hear from smaller artists who get a tour of Europe. They say like people will just, they want to see live music and they'll come out and they'll buy your stuff and they'll support. Yeah, that's what I've heard as well. And that guitar music is live and well over there, mm -hmm. um, sort of in a way that it's not as much in the U.S. But again, I haven't been there, so I, I haven't seen it. Who would you like to tour with if you could, uh, like, let's say, dream, dream tour? 
to uh, support and then maybe more like you could see yourself supporting this person in the next year? Um, for dream tour support, I really admire Leif Volabek. Mm. You're familiar with Leif? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. What, 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 what is he doing? It's yeah. so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that guy's wicked talented. It's another plane of existence. So yeah. good. That would definitely be a dream tour. Um, maybe in the next year. I don't know. I don't know in the next year. Um, yeah, that's a tough question. And there's not a whole lot of like new up and coming artists that I'm really into right now that where I'm like, I feel this on a deep emotional level. There's not too much of that that I've seen in the past couple of years. Um, hopefully there's like a new wave coming so i'll have to keep you posted on that yeah yeah i'll have to share some music with you there's this guy named wheelwright 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 down in uh phoenix and he actually he's played a show here before and then we did a podcast in my van actually when i was out in phoenix yeah and you got a van i got a van cool yeah yeah i don't live in this room anymore do you live in the van i live in the van nice so that was the the trade. That's the dream. <laughs> yeah, it's been good. It's been good. Um, but this guy, he used to be in a band called Jared in the Mill, indie band. They were touring completely independent for like eight years, basically up until COVID. COVID pretty much rocked their world. And now he's like separated himself from the band, kind of like pursuing his own music. But super talented guy yeah really incredible singer songwriter i feel like you might really connect with his stuff he kind of reminds me of zach bryan a bit too okay so dude i don't know what's going on with this yeah, monitor man it's tripping out this might be uh perhaps the end of the monitor <laughs> all right let me let me stop this one more time yeah. just to see and we're back by the way just it's to probably... see to for the okay so the conversation <laughs> the off-air conversation this can totally be in here. Why not? Yeah. This, this might be the way to promote it. Yeah. If you would like to witness, <laughs> if you would like to a private viewing session of a podcast, yeah, basically selling uh, two tickets, a couple's tickets, yeah. date night, Airbnb experience to watch a live podcast experience. It, your first your first buyer is probably going to be like Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> <laughs> like just someone wacky. Yeah, I mean, that would be pretty ironic if, like, the person who came to watch the interview was more interesting than the person right. you're interviewing, and you're like, hey, you want to, <laughs> you want to, like... Uh, Pull up a seat. Or what could be really wild is, like, for an extra fee, you, like, hand, like, you give them a mic. Right. To be in it. <laughs> just fucking, like, chirp in whenever or they want. Or they're just a heckler. Like, you just get somebody oh to come God. in and just talk mad shit <laughs> the whole time. That is, yeah, that's pretty off the wall. Yeah. That's some pretty, like, avant-garde theater right there. Yeah, so. you should look into it. <laughs> but what they don't realize, actually, oh, my God, this is this is it. You pitch it as a theatrical performance. You pretend that this is a play. <laughs> But it's, it's actually just a podcast. And these people are tricked into thinking that they're watching some like avant-garde theater. Right. That they're paying for. <laughs> Man. Or it becomes like the Truman Show and you just don't really know <laughs> what is real. Oh, my goodness. And we're like, didn't y'all get the script? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's, you know, there's some some room for development here. But yeah. I'm, I'm excited. So. Spin off. <laughs> oh, my goodness, man. Well, tell me more about this uh, this tattoo that you got today. Yeah, I looping just, back to our, our our summary of events. Yeah, first tattoo. Yeah, my parents don't know yet, so. Oh shit! Keep it. Do you keep think they're gonna watch this podcast? Probably. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know. This is how I should break it to them, actually. Wow. Yeah. If they get this far in the episode, they're like, "What's going on?" This yep. is. Yep. So the tattoo, first tattoo. Yeah. Um, Pain level? First one. Oh, man. If anyone ever told you that it doesn't hurt, they're lying. <laughs> <laughs> that it hurt. <laughs> yeah. But it's also like in my arm crease. So. Yeah. Let's see it again. Pull it out. Yeah. Pull it out. 
Let's see this puppy. Ooh. Is that in the frame? It's a yeah, so we got hands. Hands. One hand dropping, dropping flowers. A rose. Yeah, into Flat. the other hand. And um it comes from sort of a yeah, do you want the backstory? Yeah, absolutely. I would yeah. love to hear it. it. It comes from um, one of the lyrics in the songs and my project. And um, the lyric says, and now your flowers grow for someone I don't know. And um, mm. my partner helped design this. And uh, I don't know, it just kind of is like a summation of the past like year and a half of my life working on this project. And I feel like it's a milestone, like putting out a project under my own name and um, something I've wanted to do for a while. Yeah. So uh, I was originally going to get a tattoo for every tour that I went on, but that was taking a little too long. So Hell yeah. you get one for every project. I think that's amazing, man. Um, I very much am a, a big believer in symbolic gestures and mementos and ways to to keep in the forefront of the, your mind those things that you did that that took blood <laughs> blood sweat and yeah. tears yeah you know it's it's not easy especially to do it in a way that's authentic yeah and genuine and real yeah so that's yeah. pretty awesome man thank you man I'm and who was the artist it. let's let's shout out the artist yeah it was uh morgan over at 68 in orange county 68 is the name of the tattoo shop Parlor six eight. Is Parlor six yeah. eight. Okay, Parlor Morgan, eight. incredible job. Like the, she's so good. She's the incredible. Line work. Yeah, like fine line, super shading. fine line, florals. Morgan Sierra. Morgan Sierra. Thank you, Morgan. Killing it. Um, come on the podcast. Let's yeah. do a tattoo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I heard that's another another series you got. Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, yeah, I I, I love tattooing. I, I'm very fascinated by that world. And what motivates people to get tattoos, the stories behind their tattoos. Um, you know, here's to hoping that in the next 10 years, you're just completely covered, man. Yeah. Tours and projects. Yeah, I, I would like to be. How long, uh, I mean, as it's, it's actually kind of interesting. Like, for our generation, you know, I think... I wonder what's like the most tattooed generation, but I could imagine that millennials probably are the most it's tattooed generation. Yeah. Um, I remember being a kid and just dying to get tattoos. Yep. And I didn't get a tattoo until I was 21. And even for me, I thought that was like a little old. Like I was like, man, people are already getting tattooed up like in their 18. Yep. But 29 though. Yeah. I was 29 like, actually I'm, is like a little bit older for our late. generation to get a for tattoo. Sure. I was like, if I don't get one before I'm 30, I'm just probably not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> was there any, you know, other moments in the last nine years of your 20s where you were tempted to go out and get tattooed? And it's just. Yeah, definitely. But I'm such a uh, perfectionist and I'm trying to actively reject that part of myself. Hmm. Uh, I don't think it's as helpful as it is a hindrance. There can be helpful parts, um, certainly, but yeah. So I just like, I was like, I want it to mean something, but I don't want it to mean too much. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I want it to uh, look cool, but not like it's trying. And uh, mm. and how's it going to look into relation to anything that I get down the line? So all that was just crippling and I yeah. just didn't, didn't do it. Yeah, it's kind of funny. I think uh, that analysis paralysis... Is something that I actually like. It's a great phrase. Definitely. Well, it's not my phrase. I, I don't know where I heard that, but you yeah. know, it it accurately describes that. And I feel like, in a weird way, tattoos are the one area of my life where I don't, where I'm not afraid of permanence. Yeah. Interesting. And in almost everything else, it's one of the most terrifying things. Yeah. You know, and I get stuck in that analysis paralysis. And like, that's why perfectionism is so rampant in, in musicians because it is permanent. Like yeah. a performance is fleeting and, you know, it's off into the ether a minute after it's done and it doesn't, it's not, yeah, it's not permanent. Mm. Do you feel like you are more of a performing artist or do you feel more at home in the studio? I definitely enjoy my time in the studio. Um, yeah, I think it's the purest 
platform for me personally to get in touch with wherever it is that songs are written Mm -hmm. and kind of just like losing myself in that and it's like a little bit out of body and trying to get to that place is addicting and you can do that in live performance as well but there's sort of a script with the live performance and Mm. when you're in the studio or when you're writing um it's just like ultimate freedom to go anywhere and to be anyone and to Mm. say anything and i think that search for finding something that just feels really good um it's easier for me in the studio and with writing Mm mm-hmm yeah. Interesting. I kind of want to nerd out with you for sure. a second here. What is your setup? What's your studio setup? Um, I've just got a Harmony Sovereign is like my acoustic, which is all over the record. And mm. it's 1970 and it sounds incredible. I love that guitar with all my heart. Yeah. Um, that's the cornerstone. And then at home, I've just got like a, a, a Gefell microphone, UMT 70S. Okay. Are, are you familiar with Gefell? No. At all. It's like some, it's a German mic and it split off from Neumann uh, from the same parent or from the same company, I guess. And then they split off. So it's very similar and it's made with like the same capsule in the U87. Wow. So very clean, solid state. It's not a tube. Yeah. Um, Is it cheaper than a Neumann? It is like two grand. So it's for, it's like a budget, nice mic, you know, I mean budget, but like I'm still paying for it. (laughs) Yeah. Sweetwater? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yep. Yeah, hell yeah, man. That's uh that's, that's a way to do how it. How I got most of the gear in here was Sweetwater, so shout out to Sweetwater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I've got this uh upright piano that was in the cabin when Sick. we got there and um it's never in tune. I've had it tuned a couple times. Mm-hmm. And um it's never quite in tune and there's something beautiful about that until it slips out a little too much, you know. <laughs> and then it yeah, you have to tune the guitar all wrong, and then it just throws everything off. Yeah, um, yeah. What about you? What are you working with? Um, you know, it's definitely changed a little bit over the years. Um, and to be honest, I haven't really been seriously demoing anything much on my own. Right, like lately, I've used. I have an Apogee One. That has kind of been like my trusty little interface for a while. Yeah. When I demoed out the the Belarus LP, I did that down in Mexico City. And I basically just used my Ableton Push, my Apogee One, and just did the whole thing in Ableton. Yeah. Um, which is kind of weird, but I actually loved like I, I love working in Ableton. Not necessarily for like doing serious like vocal recording or like live instrument recording, but for putting together a demo, it just felt amazing to like, I love the workflow of Ableton. Yeah. And just the building block nature of it. I use Ableton as well. Oh yeah. It's pretty intuitive. Yeah. I've heard people say there's a huge learning curve, um, but it's the only thing that I ever learned. So really, it makes sense to me. Yeah. Do you use logic at all? Mm-mm. Interesting. You only work in Ableton. Yeah. Exclusively. Crazy. <laughs> Crazy. Yep. And it's like Ableton eight or something they're on like what ableton 11 now i have wow super old one wait so what do you do for your vocals like you go into ableton are you using any kind of outside plugins or yeah plugins from uh um the name escapes me what universal audio okay so is that your interface then is yeah i have a apollo twin duo nice um yeah the compressors on that are glorious Hmm. and then yeah just a bunch of uad plugins like they've got the subscription are you familiar with the UAD Spark subscription? I, I think I've heard about that. Oh, it's great. You yeah. pay 20 bucks a month and you have access you have to everything. like thousands of dollars worth of plugins. Huh. Yeah, definitely a good investment. Interesting. You just got to get that Universal Audio Apollo Twin first. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, the buy-in. <laughs> you know, I was always hesitant about the Apollo, just be, and just Universal Audio in general, because I didn't like the idea of being like stuck with their kind of ecosphere right um but then again that doesn't sound like a bad way to go yeah i mean are you i don't really use any uh, hardware i don't use much uh, outboard gear i had like an old off-brand space echo but i ended Mm -hmm. up selling it to make rent so (laughs) i mostly 
just it's like a lot of plugins. Yeah. But trying just, to get the performance as clean as possible. Do you have like a bunch of hardware gear? No, no, not really. I mean, what you see in here is probably like really what my day to day is nowadays. Like yeah. these SM7Bs, my Focusrite, Logic. I this is a new computer, which makes a huge difference. Like yeah. having a new computer. I was working on my old like MacBook Air from. 2015 for mine's a 2013 so <laughs> long that dude that's impressive man if you're making that work for you <laughs> well it freezes like about three times an hour oh my and i God. have to like it's just i'm doing Scary. way too much on it but like everything's saved on hard drive so so here's here's what's gonna happen man one of these days you're gonna get a new computer and it's just gonna change your life you're yeah. just gonna realize because that's what happened to me with this thing this new this is a new mac mini it's got the m2 in it and it feels like I can do anything yeah like when I'm editing video when I'm like I used to I have like an even older Mac mini that I had that I got in high school so like <laughs> 2010 2011 yep. like Mac mini that I was recording a t most of the podcasts I recorded were on that Jeez. and if I wanted to bounce things out, like it would just take forever. Yeah, it takes like I'll bounce something in the morning and like I'd get home from the coffee shop at like six o'clock and it would still be bouncing. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. The trouble is if you want to buy like a new laptop, you're gonna fork out like two thousand yeah, dollars to I'm get like, a new I, Mac. I could, you know, do half a project with two thousand dollars. Yeah, exactly. Like, buy two new guitars. Yeah, that's why I did like the Mac Mini. It was because I think it was I want to say 1500 or less. Yeah. And that was to upgrade some things. Like I upgraded the RAM. So it's got 24 gigs of RAM. Yeah. It's got the M2. And then, I don't know, maybe half a terabyte of like storage. Yeah. So, and I feel like this is going to be all I need for a long time. Yeah. That's great. I mean, uh, I'm probably going to get one off the black market. <laughs> just like it's it'll be maybe a 2018 you should, you should or talk to nick about that he's got the hookup for sure all right all right <laughs> nick's all over the black market he's the biggest man of the black market for sure <laughs> totally kidding um yeah you know that's that's another interesting thing i'd love to hear your perspective on the black market no <laughs> <laughs> yes, the black market, Silk Road, all those things. Yeah, your name. NFTs, crypto, <laughs> let's just, you know, anonymous. Right. Um, you know, being a musician sometimes can feel daunting on just a monetary level. Sometimes it feels like you got to buy all this shit, all this gear. And then if you want to have like a producer and session musicians and do this and that, it's like you're just shelling out thousands of dollars and merch and, you know, it's, it's overwhelming. That's why the process is, I mean, for me definitely, and I think a lot of other musicians can relate to it, but it's just like it's so slow because it's mm. hindered by finances and yeah. like that whole like having to work a second job and you have to put as much time and energy in on that as we'll be able to pay your bills and we'll also be able to fund you putting all your money into something that doesn't yet pay you. So <laughs> it's like yeah. that duality uh, is a difficult thing to uh, reconcile yeah. and it takes, I don't, I don't really know what it takes. I'm still figuring it out, but it, it's like, it's definitely not easy to have to split between those two things because if you get like a nine to five and then you're just like burned out, mm -hmm. you're not going to have any energy to pursue the thing that you want to do or yeah. want to do. So it's, I don't know, it's a difficult, um, it's a difficult line. And I think it definitely does take a long time to be able to accrue the resources that you need. Mm. Um, and there's like a, steps involved. Like I had to buy all my own gear. I had to play in a band in LA to be able to learn how to use the gear and get some chops. And then like luckily stumbled upon this cabin where I was able to record myself and then I figure out, and that's another thing, how many hats you have to wear. Like you, mm. then you have to engineer yourself, you produce yourself, then you yeah. have to be your own PR agent, then you have to be your own booking agent, yeah. then you have to be your own manager, you have to do social media, you're a content creator. <laughs> and so it's it's... 
I guess that's just this age in general. Um, I don't think that's the prerogative of any musician um, yeah. having to wear different hats, but well, it's, it's slow it, going. <laughs> it's interesting because earlier in this conversation, you talked about feeling like me, being a jack of all trades, you know, trying to do music and acting. It just wasn't really working out. Right. And what you just described as like the plight of the musician in today's age. Right. It, it sounds like you have to be a jack of all trades to just do the one thing. Like in order to do the one thing, you have to do many things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there's, it's never really been a better time to be a creative because you know, everything is at your fingertips and you can sort of do everything yourself. Um, whether you're doing that well or not, that takes time. I mm -hmm. still don't even know if I am, but like yeah. you have to do everything yourself in order to get to a place where you can sort of build up like a foundation and, and backing. And I mean, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir. It's, it's tough. Yeah, it's, it's totally tough. I mean, I've, I've definitely, I mean, I've worn, I've worn all those hats, running my own social media, being my own manager and PR and sending out emails and you're trying to juggle all of it. Uh, I'll be honest. I mean, I found it pretty exhausting Yeah. after a while, you know, especially when you feel like you don't see the results that you want to see. Yeah. I mean, there's some days where I'll, for most of the day, just like be on my computer sending emails, cold emails trying to reach out to people, yeah. whether it's booking shows or trying to contact uh, potential people to be on a team with me. And mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of administrative work too. Yeah. It, and that's something that people don't see like behind the scenes of. It's it's a lot of, there's so much, so much that goes into it that isn't really seen. Yeah. Yeah. How do you feel about all that stuff? Like, does it energize you? Does it drain you? Is it pretty neutral? Yeah, both of those two things, I think. Um, it's energizing at times. It's draining at times. Um, finding mm -hmm. an equilibrium is a task. Um, but I, I think, yeah, I said that earlier, just like as long as I'm writing good songs, I just want to be able to find a way, like what's the next thing that I can do so that I can put out a song that I'm proud of. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of little teeny baby steps involved that are uh i mean sometime eventually i'll put one out and it takes a you get there in a very circuitous kind of roundabout way and um it just takes a long time like i've been working on this project for six months of six months of pre-production <laughs> six months of pre-production yeah that was a hard one um and then we recorded for only seven days but I'd been writing the songs before that too, so it even starts six mm. months before recording. Yeah, and then it's mixed and everything, and that was uh, a year ago, and the songs not uh, are not even out yet. So it's been wow. a five-song EP for like the last what, two years. <laughs> wow. How did you go about finding funding for that EP? Was it fully self-funded? Did you crowdfund? Get investors? Yeah, I did crowdfunding. Nice. I did a uh, GoFundMe. Wow. And I'm very, very, very grateful to everybody that um, believed in me and felt like it was a cause worth donating to. Hmm. And uh, my friends and family in particular for just like giving me the building blocks to be able mm -hmm. to do that. I wouldn't have been able to do it if it was all out of pocket. I ended up yeah. funding about half of what I wanted. And the rest was just like all of my savings. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Man, just putting all the cars on or all the chips on the table. Yeah, it's it's an investment. That's something that my partner said. I was like, do I do this? I might go broke, but it's an investment in yourself. And I mean, I believe in what I do. So like I said earlier, too, it's it's a compulsion. Like I wasn't not going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That actually reminds me of a question I was going to ask you. Speaking of compulsion and music as a compulsion, what do you think? Like when you think about the reason why you make music, what are some of the things that come to mind? Like, do you make music because you just can't help it because it's a compulsion? Do you make music to speak to people, to tell a story? Like, when you think about, like, why do I make music? What comes to mind first? 
Um, joy. It gives me joy. And I think if there's a way that I can then, you know, give someone else a piece of that, then, then that's worth doing. Um, yeah, it just gives me some sort of meaning, uh, reason to wake up and keep doing the thing that I do. And if you can like reach one other person with that, then I think it's worth it. Um, yeah, it's, it's just kind of, it's the time that I feel most authentically myself as well. Um, mm. sticking with the authenticity theme, it's just like, there's really no time that I feel more fully myself than when I'm writing mm -hmm. or playing or recording. And I mean, I'll have to sit and listen to something that I'm working on for like 10 minutes before I go into work at the coffee shop. Cause I'm like centering and, mm. and it makes me feel good. And then I go to the coffee shop and it's like the daily grind. And then I get home and sort of recenter with like the thing that gives me life mm. afterwards. Um, yeah, it's just life giving. And, uh, I think that, that that creating is something that everybody can do. And I think that maybe that's not spoken about as much, but like everybody can do that. Mm -hmm. And I think it takes a certain muscle to be able to learn how to tap into your creativity. Um, but I think that's what moves the needle for humanity. That's what pushes us forward is the art of the culture. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely agree that everyone is creative. Yeah. I think that for whatever reason, that's often suppressed, pushed down, maybe particularly in our culture, in American culture. Um, you know, we're definitely very much about labels, yeah. putting people in boxes. Um, and you got to make money, man. <laughs> How are you going to make money? <laughs> well, I wonder that all the time. <laughs> so... You know, that is that is the, the trickiest question Yeah, as an artist. But, you know, one thing that I'm I'm particularly interested in about your life is the the very intentional decision to choose a lifestyle that is maybe more conducive to being able to create art. Um, you know, it's really fascinating. Like, there's definitely not one right way to do it. People come to Los Angeles and it works out for them, you know? And other people come to Los Angeles and it, like, they get stuck in the rat race for a decade or more. Yeah, and I think that something really concrete that anyone can do who's feeling stunted or uninspired or, like, they're not really moving or doing anything is, like, a simple change of environment. Mm. Or at least that's at least what I did, and it worked for me. I mean, I'm not really seeing leaps and strides in terms of uh, what most people would constitute success, but it feels better to me and mm -hmm. it feels real and it, and it feels like I'm doing the thing that I should be doing. Yeah. Um, so just like changing your environment is something, it's like, a, it's easy. I mean, maybe not easy, but if it's not working, maybe that's a step you could take, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think that environment's very important. I took a trip um, to Detroit many, many years ago. I lived in Detroit for a little bit. And that city was a place that was deeply inspiring to me. Complete change of scenery. Didn't know anybody there. You know, met, was meeting people for the first time. And kind of like a big reset button, you know, like starting from scratch. Yep. And yet that was one of the most inspiring times of my life. And also one of the most creative times of my life too. What would you say that you learned? Oh man. Um, so when I was there, I stumbled, well, okay. I, I, I mean, I learned, there was kind of like a few categories of what I learned. I learned a lot about the city, the history of the city and what is going on there, which is like a whole other story. Um, I learned that the people in Detroit were some of the most incredible people I'd ever met in my life. And there was a, an element of just resilience to people, like to people who are actually from Detroit, like lived in through the chaos of that city. Right. There's a motto 
uh, in Latin. I, I don't know what the Latin is, but the translation is from the ashes, we will rise. That's the motto of Detroit, which could be a Beautiful. more fitting motto considering its history with fires and, right. and houses being burned down <clears throat> and devil's night and all that. Um, so I was really inspired by those individuals, the resilience that they had, but also too, I stumbled into this community of artists, poets, musicians who were playing house shows outside of Detroit in Taylor, Michigan, if you're familiar. And these people were not well off. They did not have a lot of money. They were young and broke. Yeah. And all they had was art and each other. And I've never seen a more, uh, like a more unified group of people. Like you would sit in someone's living room watching somebody playing guitar and everyone was quiet and everyone was listening to the performance and people knew the lyrics wow. to these artists and not even just the singer songwriters, but the poets. Yeah. Like there would be touring poets who would come through and like people knew the lyrics to their poetry. Yeah. Which was just insane. And so I was deeply what a great community affected by that. Yeah. Um, and then also too, I think I learned what different lifestyles can look like. I met people who had left. You know, one thing I learned is that if you meet somebody in Detroit who's not from Detroit, they're probably doing something interesting <laughs> because no one just up and moves to Detroit. Yeah. At least at the time I was there, like in 2016, like the neighborhood that I lived in was like half burnt down and abandoned. You know, like and when I went there, people were like, what are you doing? Like, why are you wanting to go to Detroit? Like, why would you want to go there? At the time, it had the highest crime rate in America. But the people that I met who moved to Detroit were all doing cool shit. Yeah. Like, they were artists or entrepreneurs or they had come with, like, a, you know, maybe, like, a missional sense of what to do. Like, I, I met this family who was one of the sweetest families that I've ever met. And they had left their life in Colorado and um, motivated by their faith, they moved to Detroit to just live in that community and just be part of the community. Yeah. And just be someone's neighbor and just just be a part of the community. That was it. Yeah. And they were some of the most real, genuine, authentic people I'd ever met. Um, Do you feel like that's lacking here in Los Angeles then? <laughs> Man, you know, Los Angeles is such a funny place because, you, you, I mean, I think you get, well, okay, to be fair, I've never met anyone who's moved to Los Angeles because they're like, like, I left everything to just be in this community and just <laughs> love the people here. I've never <laughs> once met someone like that. So, yes, that's a big difference. Uh I don't know. I mean, everyone I meet here who's not from Los Angeles, like they came here pursuing a dream. Yeah. What and it's usually something revolving like uh a job, money, success, fame, music, acting, dancing, modeling. Like everyone's pursuing this thing. Um which is incredible and at the same time too can feel very um isolating and the fact that like everyone's in their own silo doing their own thing yep grinding grinding we're all grinding yeah so that cohesive community that you talked about uh in detroit that's what i wasn't able to quite find here and i think it's why it was maybe easier for me to up and change my environment because it seemed like everything here in los angeles was really quid pro quo and it's like mm -hmm. well i'll do this for you but what's it really doing for me? Yeah. And um, yeah, I'll help you on this, but it's a favor and I'm going to need something in return. Yeah. Or like, yeah, I'll come out to your show, but like what what's in it for me? <laughs> yeah. I think there's a lot of that here. I will say that I'm 
I've begun to f- like I've I've started to find relationships that are working relationships that um are also personal personal and don't quite operate on like a quid pro quo aspect it's more of like a hey i genuinely enjoy you as a person and like let's work together yeah because we enjoy each other you know and if i have something i'll bring you on if you have something you'll bring me on and like there is kind of this like it might be specific to the industry that i work in because i work in events and it's very relational and it's very reputation based and um, but within that, I've found people that it's like, yeah, like you're somebody that I really enjoy. Yeah. Whether it's in work or out of work. And like, I, you know, care about you and respect you. And um, that doesn't feel the same as what you're talking about. But I have seen that and felt that and experienced that many times. And I'm that sure way. that that's here. Like, I would never tell anybody, like, don't move to Los Angeles. I'm sure that mm. it works for a lot of people. It's just totally case by case. Yeah. yeah. Where did you live when you lived in LA? Van Nuys. Oh, interesting. Yep. Yep. Up hmm. there in the, yeah, deep in the, <laughs> yeah, that's where. <laughs> How long did you live in Van Nuys for? Like three, three years. I lived okay. in Sherman Oaks for a year and then Van Nuys for three. And that was your total experience in LA? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I think like where you live in LA makes a big difference too. Probably. It's so different. Like, I mean, DTLA very different vibe than Culver City or Venice or and I think that you know what that's another thing too there's pockets where there's really great community like the climbing gym that I go to Cliffs of Ed incredible community like that is probably one of the things that's allowed me to stay sane in this city is that place yeah I've met so many so many awesome people through that climbing gym I've had people on the podcast Sick. through that climbing gym. Um, I have good friendships there, good sauna sessions, yeah. good climbs. Like it's just everything's amazing. all out in the open in a sauna session. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent. And um, so I think that you just got to find that, but yeah. it, it's hard. It's not easy. Yeah. Um, and there are nice little pockets like that, and and I feel like maybe. Maybe more so with people who don't work in the film industry, like that community you're talking about based around climbing. Yeah. I would, I don't know. Well, and that's, that's actually a really interesting point. Yeah. No one's competing for each other's job. Right. You're all just enjoying climbing. Yep. Everyone's just there because they love it. In music and like, you're not jealous that somebody can climb a V10 and you're only climbing V5s or whatever. You're like, damn, that's sick, you know? Yeah. But I might be jealous that someone got some, like, in, you know, someone that was, like, one of my contemporaries, like, their song blew up or whatever, you know? Yeah. Because it just feels more personal. You're like, damn, I wish that. Yeah, that social comparison is such a deadly thing, but it's something Terrible. that we, every everyone we all struggle with. Yeah. Do you find um, that living up in more of a remote situation, you're more immune to some of those things? That's a good question. Um, yes and no, because I definitely feel healthy doses of self-doubt all the time like that's always present Mm -hmm. um but it it is sort of like your own little universe that that you can build and um it's easy to get lost in a song or creating anything really and it's like the whole outside world is not there Mm -hmm. at all and it's just like this is what i can control and this is what i can create and so it's easy to lose yourself to like days, hours, two years and, and something like that. Yeah. And um, I definitely think not being around people all the time is good for my headspace. Mm-hmm. I feel like that for me, I get a little bit more lost. Um, but maybe that's just because I'm an introvert. I think being around mm-hmm. people all the time also energizes people that are extroverts. Yeah. If that's the definition of those two things i don't really know but um yeah so yes and no 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I definitely don't think that like the cabin in the woods scenario is for everyone, but I think that the moral of the story is like finding what actually is right for you and not necessarily what is prescribed. Absolutely. By, you know, the powers that be or by what society says. I mean, I came to Los Angeles because I had this idea in my mind that like as a musician, that was what I had to do. And I'm glad I came to LA. And I think that I learned a lot and I think that an insane amount of doors opened up for me. Um, At the same time, like is Los Angeles the thing that truly feeds my soul? Probably not. (laughs) (laughs) Probably not, you know? Yeah. Like, I think in small doses, I love it. Yeah. But, you know, small, precise, carefully planned out doses. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I think, yeah, you got to... Like 50 milligrams. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect. Perfect (laughs) dose of LA. 50 cc's of Los Angeles, please. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I mean... What works for one person is not going to work for another person. Yeah, like, there's you no... you got to find the thing that is going to let you be in the zone. Right. There's no right way to do anything. Yeah. Um, and you feel like you're in the zone? Yeah. For myself personally, I feel like I'm finding some sort of footing and and being authentic with my work. Mm. Um, I would say that I am, yeah. Oh. Is there anything that you would change looking back at your 20s? Hmm. No, not really. You would do the the three years in LA, Van Nuys and and Sherman Oaks? Yeah, I think everything needed to happen the way that it it was going to happen, and that's the way that it was supposed to be. And um, yeah, just lessons learned, things that I would do differently in the future, but... Mm -hmm nothing that I would go back and like drastically change. Cause like what butterfly effect would that lead to? Right. Like I met my partner, uh, here in Los Angeles and, um, there we go. Then we moved up to the cabin together. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I am very happy right now with where things have led me. And, yeah. uh, so to change anything seems dangerous. So what about some of those lessons then looking forward into the future? Um, you know, like, what are you, what are you taking from your twenties into your thirties and what are you leaving behind? Hmm. I would say just to, to not, <clears throat> not really settle for something that doesn't feel entirely correct. Um, and to listen to that voice in your head. I think that everyone's got like a little voice that is saying something that you kind of try to push down and subdue and maybe numb and listening to it, I think will ultimately take you to the place that you want to be, even if it does take however long, Mm -hmm. um, an infinity. Um, but yeah, just trusting your gut and trusting your instinct, or I'm talking to myself, trusting my gut and trusting my instincts and, yeah, I think so far they've led me in a good direction. What am I leaving behind? I don't know. What are you leaving behind? <laughs> <laughs> you're turning you're turning 30 as well, yeah? I am. Uh, you know, I think there's quite a few things I'm probably leaving behind. Um I think that Going into my 30s, the plan is to make a lot more healthy choices in terms of what I consume yeah. and imbibe <laughs> in my body. Um, yeah, I think I had a lot of fun in my 20s. But there's, you know, a, a certain element of like, I really want to make sure that I'm setting myself up for a life that is enjoyable. And that means like not eating hamburgers every day. Yeah. That's, you know, like actually, actually being a lot more cognizant about like the, the dietary choices that I make, not drinking as much, 
you know, I think too, like, actually, this is, this is something that I have been thinking about a lot. Um, being more selective with the people that I bring into my circle. That's a heavy hitter. Yeah. You know, and I think that I, I wasn't as careful through a lot of my twenties about the people that I let be around me. And I think that there were some people who were not the best for me, you know, whether it was, um, just negativity or, uh, not the best influence, you know? And it's funny cause I feel like you grow up and your, your parents always tell you, or people always tell you like, you are who your friends are or like, be careful who you spend time with or these things that you're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah. It's just, it's so true. The people that you surround yourself by are going to be a major influence in how you live your life and the things that you do. So, um, that's definitely something I'm leaving behind. Yeah. That's a 20s. big one. I think a lot of people can relate to that. Um, I would say for me, I would like to leave behind some judgments. Um, mm. I'd like to be less judgmental. I was talking mm. about this earlier with some friends and I'd like to be less judgmental towards other people that are also creating. Um, mm. I'm just a total snob about certain things. Um, persnickety is the word that my mom <laughs> used. Um, and not all things, but certain things like coffee. I'm a big coffee snob, but I, mm -hmm. who cares about being judgmental about coffee? Um, As you should be. Yeah. hundred percent. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but things like anyone who's creating something, I would like to embrace that more, more wholeheartedly and mm -hmm. like kind of reel myself in. And be, even if it's like some auto-tuned, like some ridiculous auto-tune nonsense that I think is like, I'm like, what, what is this? Um, mm. Even if I don't relate to it, I, I would like to come from that perspective a little bit more and be like, if this person is doing something true to them and they really like it, um, who the hell am I to be like, this is, this is silly, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think in terms of what I'm bringing into my thirties and tagging on to what you said I think that trusting your gut is actually so crucial yeah and that voice in your head like there's a reason why you sometimes get these ideas and these things that you just can't shake right and it's it's not going to go away right especially if it hasn't gone away yet like if you had that thing just in your head telling you like man I just if only I could do this, if only it was if, like, you know, we make all these excuses and all these rational rationalizations of why this certain thing can't occur, which is the thing that you just keep coming back to. It's like, right. Okay. How am I just going to decide to like make this actually work? Yeah. And it starts with a lot of little steps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that's another thing too, realizing that, there's no one day answer. There's like a, I don't know how exactly how to put it eloquently yet, but you know, that one day answer is going to look like a thousand little days. Right. You know? Right. And just being okay with like the smallest step in the right direction. Yeah. And so I think that just a good metric of that would be like, if you can look at yourself in the mirror and like, honestly ask yourself what you did today to get you closer to the place that, mm whatever that place is that you see yourself. And if, as long as you have an answer every single day, then I think that's really all you can ask for. And yeah. it can be something really, really tiny. Yeah. It doesn't need to be leaps and bounds every day, and it, it can't be. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really easy to feel like everything has to be so instant. Yep. You know, especially when you go on Instagram and you... Like today, I saw... Well, maybe this isn't the best example. I think... A better example is when you watch like a fitness video on, on Instagram and you're like, dang, like that's insane. And you're like, yeah. wow, I, why can't I just do that instantly? Right. Um, you know, we're, so, we're constantly bombarded by things that we're comparing ourselves to. Yeah. Or wishing we were doing like, wow, I wish I was on that sailing trip in the, <laughs> you know, yeah. Mediterranean or whatever I it is. I wish I was on that too. <laughs> but... I think it's, you're totally right. Like, what can you say at the end of the day that you did that just 
move the needle yeah. in the right direction. Yeah, that's, that's all. That's all you can ask. Like, you know, and also understanding that I think we touched on earlier. There's no right way to do anything. Like, you'll you can do two things that are diametrically different from one another and probably achieve the same result. Yeah. And and maybe different time periods, maybe in the same time period. And I just think that, yeah, understanding that that there's no right way is is a nice barrier to break through mentally mm -hmm. yeah yeah man well dude this has been this is good whiskey man you got me <laughs> talking yeah that'll be on part two that's when we break out the real whiskey all right <laughs> um dude thank you so much for coming on the show it's been it's been great getting to know you yeah man you as well you know i feel like we're already close <laughs> hell yeah that's one of the 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 really cool things that i like about podcasting is like just creating a brief moment of intentionality to just talk to somebody, get to know them. Yeah, man. Get to hear their story. I'm excited for your future tours. Thank and you. Tattoos. Yeah, me as and well. Projects. I'll come back in like a month from now and just be like absolutely covered. Covered, man. I hope so. Yeah. Where can people find your music, your socials, all the things that you want them to find? Yeah, they can. Um, I'm on Instagram, just like Emery Duncan. Um, I'm sure we can link it in there somewhere. But mm -hmm. yeah, same thing if you look it up on Spotify or Apple Music. Tight. Um, just my name. TikTok? Eh, not really. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm really trying. Don't push oh, me, Sheldon. Man. Listen, <laughs> TikTok is a... I don't even know what to think about TikTok. Yeah, me neither. We'll save that for episode two. <laughs> exactly. Maybe that will be in the cabin. Yeah. What do you mean? We should do a podcast oh, in the cabin, Oh, a cabin man. podcast? That's a great idea. I actually, I just, uh, so I just got this field recorder, the Zoom H6. Ooh. And the reason why I got it is so I can do podcasts like out and yeah. about in the real world. Have you done like a van podcast? One, but it was like sketchy. It wasn't, mm. but I'm going, so I'm headed to the desert next week to interview a bunch of van lifers at this like big van life gathering cool. in the desert. Really cool. So I'm taking these mics and... The monitor. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'll, be, I'll be interviewing some people in my van, probably some people in their vans. It's going to be wild. That's going to be great. What's it called, the, the gathering? It's called Schoolie Palooza. Schoolie Palooza. It's the biggest van life gathering in America. Wow. That sounds like a ton of fun. It's insane. You guys should come. It's a yeah. good time. <laughs> if, you, if you guys want to camp, I mean, uh, it's free. All people are welcome. Sweet. It's from the 15th to the 22nd. We don't have a van. I'm sure some of that imposter syndrome might No, that's in, what but. I'm saying. It's okay, man. You can just camp. Oh, cool. Like, people come in all sorts of different modes and ways and yeah. ways of being. So, but it's it's kind of like the next Burning Man. It kind of feels like that. There's a lot of crossover. A lot yeah. of those people also go to Burning Man. Gotcha. Um, but it's a little bit more family friendly. You know, there's a lot of families, but there's also like a rave every night and there's different camps for different things. Yeah. There's going to be some concerts, some music. Sweet. I'm going to be playing a set out there. Oh, yeah. Nice, <laughs> Which man. is going to be wild. It's going to be a great time. So, um, but yeah, think about it. Yeah. But Cabin Podcast. Yeah, we're definitely That'll doing that. That'll be part two. Yeah, we'll do it. So, and we'll chop some wood. We'll make a fire. Yeah, maybe see if we can get like Shia LaBeouf up there. I hope so. Shy, <laughs> if you're listening, man, come through. All right, man. Well, dude, thank you so much. Yeah, it's thank been you, awesome. Sheldon. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it man. Yeah. And uh, looking forward to hearing the project, man. So Likewise. Take care. Cheers. Thank you for listening to the Spring Street Podcast. If you'd like to support the show, sign up for the Patreon to receive exclusive behind-the-scenes content and check out the sponsor links in the description.